Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like today to share the knowledge with you. And I would like, before I start my uh, presentation, that everybody will thank God that, alhamdulillah, we are spontaneously breathing, all of us. And then uh, today we are going to discuss uh, what is the difference between uh, the uh, mechanics, lung mechanics during this spontaneous versus the mechanical breathing within the mechanical ventilation. Because usually we allow our patients, once they are not uh, anymore too much sick, we allow them to have a spontaneous breathing. And so during that trials of spontaneous breathing, we have to calculate the lung mechanics uh, to know whether our patients are really improving or still they need more manipulation of the ventilation and more time. So uh, let's just uh, review together with uh, each other. What are the benefits of having a spontaneous breath? Uh, preserving a spontaneous breathing is associated with fewer complications than controlled ventilation during positive pressure uh, respiratory support, such as when you spontaneously breathe, uh, there will be increased uh, gas distribution of the dependent lung regions. And your cardiac performance is gonna improve. And uh, once you have improved uh, distribution of the gas, you will promote the ventilation uh, perfusion matching because most of our patients who needs intubation, they have uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. And also uh, early spontaneous breathing will prevent the diaphragm atrophy disuse because we know that with uh, prolonged ventilation and if it is uh, completely controlled presses, then uh, the diaphragm will, will start to atrophy early. And uh, also when you are uh, allowing your patient to have a spontaneous breathing, that you decrease the use of the sedative and analgesic medications. Uh, so uh, we know that the activation of the inspiratory muscles and the biggest respiratory muscle is the diaphragm. And once this diaphragm will contract, it will create like a vacuum. And then this will lead to a greater negative pleural pressure and transalveolar pressure, which will improve the homogeneous distribution of ventilation and diminish the atelectasis. And we know that uh, once you have more negative pleural pressure, then this will allow more uh, space for the lungs to expand, and then you will have easy inspiration. And then the areas which were atelectatic, they will start to open up, and then you will improve your uh, VQ mismatch. Okay, uh, this already we talked about that during inspiration, uh, once the intercostal muscles will uh, increase the thoracic cage, will pull it upwards, and then uh, it will lead to more space for the lung expansion. And then uh, our, the intrapleural pressure usually is around minus four uh, at rest, and then become uh, subatmospheric or more negative. And then as a result of this, our trans pulmonary pressure will increase. And we know that the differences on the pressures are the ones which allow the gas flow. And the uh, trans pulmonary pressure is equal to the alveolar pressure minus the intrapleural pressure. And the transpulmonary pressure is the pressure difference holding the lungs open. When the transpulmonary pressure is eliminated, then the lung tend to collapse. And this typically happens when you have the pneumothorax. Uh, then with pneumothorax, the pressure, intrapleural pressure, because of the accumulation of the air is gonna be positive. And then uh, your transpulmonary pressure will fall down and then the lungs are going to collapse. Uh, but sometimes this spontaneous breath can have adverse uh, breathing can have adverse um, adverse effects. A spontaneous breathing during mechanical ventilation may induce uh, some conditions that can aggravate the lung injuries. So that we should not rush to put the patient on a spontaneous breathing if he is not ready yet. Uh, one of the adverse uh, events is the alveolar overdistension caused by increased transalveolar pressure and the high pulmonary capillary blood flow caused by increased cardiac output. As we all know that once you have the spontaneous breathing and then you have the more negative pressure in the pleura, this will improve the uh, venous return uh, of the blood to your heart. And then we know that once the venous return is optimized, 
then your cardiac output will be higher. And then uh, the patient might have a rapid respiratory rate when he is having a spontaneous breathing on the ventilator. And if your patient is having uh, SN coronary with the ventilator, then uh, lung injury is a high possibility here. So that you make sure that your patient having a good SN coronary with the ventilator. But uh, even though recently several experimental studies show that preserving spontaneous breathing during mechanical ventilation can attenuate the uh, ventilator-induced lung injury in patients with acute lung injury. Then we talk to the main uh, talk here in our presentation is the mecha respiratory mechanics in the spontaneous and assisted ventilation. In humans, uh, ventilation involves the movement of the chest wall to produce a pressure gradient that will permit flow and the movement of the gas. This can be accomplished by the uh, respiratory muscles if you are having a spontaneous breathing or by the negative pressure ventilation. This is historical when they were using the iron lung or by positive pressure ventilation, the current uh, mechanical ventilation that we are using. Uh, we need to understand the lung mechanics to understand some definitions. And I try to make it as simplified as I can. So one of the important thing to understand is the compliance. We have two uh, types of compliance that we have to have it to have a good gas flow. The, we have to have the lung compliance and the chest wall compliance. The lung compliance describes the willingness of the lungs to distend. So if it is very easy for the lungs to distend, it means that these lungs are very compliant. And if it is very difficult to distend these lungs, and you need more pressure to distend the lung, it means that this lung is sick, injured, whatever the cause, and then it is having a less compliance. And the reverse of the compliance is the elastance. And the elastance, what we mean by the elastance is the willingness to return to the resting position. And the compliance equal the delta V divided by delta P. What do we mean by the delta V? Delta V is the change in the volume corresponding to the change in the uh, pressure. So delta V divided by delta P is the compliance. And the inverse of the compliance is the elastance. And we, as we explained that elastance, that the, the lung will go back to, her, uh, to its resting position, while the lung compliance is the distensibility of the lungs. Airway pressure during inflation is influenced uh, by both uh, the thoracic and the chest wall compliance and the thoracic uh, resistance to the flow because also the thorax do have uh, elastic recoil. A resistance to flow must be eliminated if you want to measure the compliance. And this accomplished by measuring the pressure and volume during a, a period of zero flow. And this is term static measurement because we, if we measure the compliance uh, during no flow, this we name it the static compliance. We have also a dynamic compliance and we have a static compliance. During zero flow, this is static compliance. And this is one of the um, very important curves that we should understand very well. Uh, this is what we name it is the pressure volume curve. Uh, if we focus here in this curve, it has two limbs. This is the inspiratory limb, inspiration, and this is expiration. So here in this uh, curve, as you see, we are starting here from the area of de recruitment. The lung here already not opened. And once you are applying the pressure, there is minimum change in the volume. But once you reach here, this point, a minimal change in the pressure will cause significant change in the volume. And this point here, the junction between this first part where it is difficult to distend the lungs or expand the lungs, and the part where the lungs are more compliant, here this we name it the lower inflection point. And then as you go with the pressures, you reach here an upper point where uh, increment in the pressure 
will not cause significant change in the volume because here already your lungs are hyperinflated. And if you continue, then it will be a flat line. And this is the area of over distinction. And the compliance of the lung here at this area is less. So lung uh, very compliant in this area and it continue to be compliant and then the compliance will decline till you reach the area of hyperinflation. And this, uh, the junction between the area of the uh, compliant lung here and the area of hyperinflation, we, we, we name it the upper inflection point. And then this is the expiration when that you will have the uh, deceleration of the pressure with corresponding deceleration of the volume. And here a very interesting another curve, which teach us that, uh, as we mentioned that uh, the compliance uh, you have, if for the whole respiratory system, it, it combines both the lung and chest wall compliance. And we have two forces, both for the lung and the chest wall. We have expanding force, which tend to increase the volume of the chest or increase the volume of the lungs. And we have a collapsing forces, which reduce the volume of the chest or the volume of the lung. And this dotted line show us the chest wall compliance. And this one show us the lung compliance. And this third line, which is a continuous line, show us the compliance of both the lung and chest wall. And if, as you can see here, uh, at the functional residual capacity, these two forces are already balanced, the collapsing force and the expanding force. So uh, here you have equal balance between these two forces at the functional residual capacity for the lung and chest wall compliance. Uh, just to make us understand the, the forces that affect the lung during inspiration and expiration, we have different pressures. Uh, we have here the atmospheric pressure and the pressure at the uh, mouth opening. And then uh, we have the airways and then we have the terminal unit here, we have the alveoli and this is the pressure in the alveoli. And then here we have two forces. We have the outward recoil of the chest wall, and then we have the inward recoil of the lungs. And we have, as we mentioned before, uh, we have the pleural pressure, which plays also a major role in the lung mechanics. And we have the transpulmonary pressure, which equal the alveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. These are the all the forces that affect the lungs. Uh, reduce compliance, now we understand, sorry. Russell, uh, for the residents, can you go back to the previous slides? Is this slide clear for the residents? Uh, because this is very important for our trainees, please. Yes, uh, I believe that because the, the flow of the gas will depend on the pressure gradient. If you don't have a pressure gradient, then the gas will not flow. And we will tell, we'll talk further details about uh, the flow of the gas also. And I try to simplify it so all people of different levels can understand the mechanics. Okay. Uh, we mentioned that reduced compliance can be caused by either problems in the chest wall or in the lungs or both of them. And to separate the contribution made by each to the total lung compliance, a measurement of intrapleural pressure is needed. But of course, we cannot measure the intrapleural pressure directly, but we can put a balloon in the esophagus, and this will be the surrogate for the intrapleural pressure. So esophageal pressure can tell us approximately how much is the pleural pressure. And this uh, table show us the different causes for decreased uh, chest wall compliance, uh, such as obesity. We know with the obesity, uh, you will have subcutaneous fat and this fat will make it different to overcome the chest wall, uh, uh, the chest wall, uh, this one, uh, elastance, because 
it tends to bring the chest down. It will resist the inflation of the chest or pulling the chest up. So you, if you are ventilating an obese patient, you need more pressure and this pressure, just this, uh, this one to overcome the chest wall resistance. And also with the ascites and with neuromuscular weakness, here, because you have more, uh, uh, because with the weakness, then the, the, the elastance of the chest wall will be more. So it will hinder the compliance. As you remember, when we talk initially in our initial slide that the elastance is the reverse for the compliance. And we have the flight case also, kyphoscoliosis, fibrosorax, pectus excavatum, and chest wall tumors, paralysis, scleroderma, all this will, are going to decline or decrease the compliance of the chest wall. And uh, for the lungs cause of decreased uh, major lung, uh, measurement of lung compliance, one of them is the tension pneumothorax because we mentioned that already. With the tension pneumothorax, you have accumulation of the air in the pleural space. It make it, it will raise the pressure in the pleura and then this tend to collapse the lungs. And if you have main stem intubation because you are ventilating only one uh, lung unit, then the compliance will be low. If you have hyperinflation because there is no more area to inflate the lungs, then the compliance will be also low. With the pulmonary edema, also the compliance is tend to be low with pulmonary fibrosis because it's very difficult to inflate the lung, you need more pressure if you have a fibrosis or if you have ARDS. That's why if you see a patient with ARDS to generate a minimum tidal volume, you need high pressure. And this is because the lungs are not compliant. And there is other uh, causes. And then respiratory system compliance is routinely recorded at the bedside of critically ill patient. In mechanical ventilation, uh, this is done uh, by measuring the end expiratory alveolar pressure and end inspiratory alveolar pressure. Uh, the end inspiratory alveolar pressure is the plateau pressure. So that the change in the volume is the tidal volume. And the uh, end expiratory pressure is the pressure associated with alveolar distension at the end of a breath. And in a normal individual, uh, this usually is zero. But while in a ventilated, because this is, uh, like uh, reflecting the PEEP or together with the intrinsic PEEP if the patient is having interest, intrinsic PEEP. So if in a ventilated patient, the, the pressure in the alveoli at the end of expiration should equal at least to the PEEP, but sometime when we are measuring it, it is uh, more than the PEEP. And this is another diagram just to show us comparison of the lung compliance in different conditions. So here, this is the pressure, transmural pressure, and this is the volume change, and this is the compliance of the chest wall. And here, this is in a normal individual. The slope is like that. And if you compare three uh, persons, someone who is having emphysema, we know that emphysema does lung tend to be very compliant, but once it reaches the hyperinflation, then the compliance of the emphysema does lung is gonna decrease. This is the normal lung and here the fibrosed lung. With the fibrosed lung, the tissues are gonna be stiff. So you need more uh, pressure to uh, distend this. So there, the compliance of a fibrosed lung, uh, understandable, it is low. So the very compliant lung in emphysema, the normal lies in between and in a fibrotic low compliance. And here both, the combination of both lung and chest wall, uh, because we know that the forces should be uh, uh, recorded to, together for the total uh, compliance, the, you have to combine both of them. The lung and chest wall compliance is still, uh, the emphysema will have more compliant lung and chest wall, both of them, and the normal will lie here in the middle and for the fibrosis, it will be less. Okay, then uh, one of the important parameters here we are measuring our ventilated patient is autopeep. Autopeep can be measured in the patient on mechanical ventilator by creating an end expiratory pause. And this can be measured if you are putting your patient in a, a volume mode or a pressure mode, both you can still measure the autopeep. 
And if you want to decrease the amount of OTP on a patient on mechanical ventilation, you need to decrease the respiratory rate and prolong the expiratory phase of ventilation. And why OTP happened? OTP happened when, uh, I will show the diagram, maybe it will be easier, yes. Here, this is the flow and this is the time. And this is the inspiration and this is the expiration. So here the inspiration, we don't have problem. And then expiration will start. And then if you start to empty the gas from your lung, you should go back to the baseline. But the problem here, you don't go back to the baseline and then inspiration will start before expiration finish. And this will, uh, will lead that you will have an autopy because you will build up this volume, remaining volume will build up the pressure inside the lungs at the end of expiration. Uh, so whenever you are seeing uh, this area is not going back to the baseline, this means that your patient is having autopeep. And autopeep, if not managed, it will lead to hyperinflation of the lung. And then once the lungs are hyperinflated, then the lung compliance change to decrease. And if you did not manage it, then the patient will have uh, accumulation of CO2 and uh, the patient can have a rupture of his alveoli and can have pneumothorax if you did not manage the autopy. And in order to protect the lungs from barotrauma, uh, you have to permit a uh, certain amount of hypoventilation because acutely uh, your patient uh, may have, because of this autopy, some CO2, especially the asthmatic, they might have the autopy and then they have CO2 retention. Once you ventilate them, you have to go for a permissive hypercapnia. And uh, you can do that with using a lower respiratory rate and tidal volume. And with time, uh, your auto peep is gonna be reduced. And then also if the resistance of the airways fall down, then it will be e e uh, easier for the patient to have uh, expiration and then the CO2 will come down. Before I move to the flow and resistance, um, do you have any area which is not very clear? Type. Flow, you remember that we said that uh, the flow of gas is uh, dependent on the pressure gradients. Uh, and it is inversely related to the resistance to the flow. Because if you have resistance, then uh, the flow is going to be less. So this relationship is described at the following equation. Q, which is the flow of the airway, equal the delta P, which is the pressure gradient, divided by the resistance. So if you have more resistance, your flow is going to be compromised. If you have low uh, resistance, then your flow is going to be optimum. And in the lung, we have two types of flow. We have laminar flow and turbulent flow. And usually the turbulent flow is where the turbulent flow in the large airways and the bifurcation of the trachea. But the laminar flow uh, is in the distal airways. So uh, we know that uh, in laminar flow, the resistance is related to three factors, the radius or the diameter of the airway, and the length of the airway and the gas viscosity. These three factors, please remember, these three factors will affect the flow and affect the resistance. And the greater the resistance, less is the flow, and the less is the resistance, more is the flow. Uh, the accurate measurement of the airway resistance during spontaneous uh, breathing again requires placement of a esophageal balloon to estimate the pleural pressure. And this allows us for determination of the pressure gradient, which is the transpulmonary pressure equal uh, pleural uh, pressure minus the airway pressure at any given lung volume. And to do this, they are measuring the expiratory flow and then uh, they will uh, correlate it to the pleural pressure. Uh, then uh, we understand, I feel that we understand that the flow is governed by the difference in the pressures 
and the resistance. Then we have the work of reason and impedance. Impedance to airflow include the resistance, which we talked about it just now, as well as the forces required to overcome the elasticity of the lung and chest wall. We remember that we defined that the, the elasticity of both lung and chest wall means that their willingness to go to back to their resting volumes. So it is the reverse of the compliance. So uh, you, to have a good flow, you have to have enough work to overcome this, both the elasticity of the lung and the elasticity of the chest wall together with overcoming the resistance uh, plus the friction also. Uh, there is also the inertia of the airways, which is part of the impedance. Uh, impedance, like the, uh, what I can understand from impedance, impedance is the, the forces that will resist the flow. But uh, the inertia uh, of the airways is uh, very negligible uh, in respiratory facility, so we can ignore it. And impedance can be estimated through measurement of the work of breathing. In the adult, they are estimating the, the work of breathing of the patient on the ventilator. But for us as pediatrician, this is not a routine. During a spontaneous breathing or while the patient is receiving mechanical uh, uh, ventilation, the equation of motion can be modified to determine the average pressure with this equation. The average pressure equals the tidal volume divided by the inspired time times the resistance plus the uh, tidal volume divided by two times the compliance plus the peak expiratory and expiratory pressure. Uh, as I mentioned, TI is the inspiratory time, PA average is the average inspiratory pressure, and the PX is the end expiratory pressure. And all these variables uh, with this uh, advanced ventilators now we are having, you can calculate at the bedside. Therefore, the uh, average uh, inspiratory pressure indicates the pressure needed to overcome all the resistance, uh, the forces that I talk about, the frictional forces, the elastic forces, the impedance, and as well as the pressure resulting from hyperinflation. Uh, now we we'll go back again to patient with uh, asthma and chronic bronchitis. They have airway inflammation and they have uh, edema, some edema also sometimes of the airways. Uh, this will decrease the radius uh, of the airway. And once the radius of the airway will be reduced, then the resistance to the flow is increased. And this is most prominent during expiration. During inspiration, still they can, they can inspire, the, the air will go inside their lungs. But once they want to expire or exhale the air, the resistance will hinder the flow. So, so the expiration will become active even if the patient is not uh, intubated. And this uh, increase in the resistance will reduce the flow and then it will cause the air trapping and auto peep, the one I talked about just uh, initially. And then there is the uh, Posselius law. He said that if you double the radius, then the resistance gonna be less by 16 fold. So narrowing of the airways really increase significantly the resistance. Now I give you a pause so that you can absorb because too much information is now, but these are all the basics for the lung mechanics during the mechanical ventilation. And once you decided to discontinue mechanical ventilation, you have to have also this pause and go back and think again. My patient is ready for exhibition or is still not yet. How you decide that your patient is ready for exhibition or not? Okay, successful extubation will depend on close assessment of your patient respiratory mechanics while it's on the ventilator. Uh, it is important to recall the indication for mechanical ventilation and intubation because we know that sometimes we do intubate patients for reasons outside the respiratory system. So we make sure that you resolve the initial problem so that you'll be able to extubate the patient. And uh, examples for this is altered mental status, upper GI bleeding, uh, threatening the airways, uh, uh, recurrent aspiration, hemoptysis, heart failures. These are some examples that uh, uh, you have other causes uh, which can lead to mechanical ventilation to protect other systems other than their lungs. And it might be a
accompanied by noise paratory mechanics. But mechanical ventilation may be necessary until this indication already has been addressed. addressed. Uh, Winning trials are recommended for patients with uh, prolonged uh, intubation or cardiopulmonary causes for intubation. So you, you have to win the patient and the classical way we are winning here in our pediatric population that we put the patient on the CPAP mode, a spontaneous breathing trial. And then the pressure support should usually be less than 12 centimeters water and the PEEP should be less than seven. In the pediatric, we agreed that uh, a PEEP of five is optimum, but uh, yeah, and you can change it in case by case. Some ex ex exceptions are there. And then the size of the endotracheal tube will influence the level of CBAP required to overcome the resistance of the tube. We know that we give the pressure support to overcome the resistance of the tube. And as we mentioned, just now, the smaller is the tube, then you need more pressure to overcome the resistance. And when a patient is on a spontaneous uh, breathing trial, there are several uh, mechanical variables that can help to predict successful excavation. Uh, uh, one of these is the rapid shallow breathing index, has been widely used to help to predict subsequent respiratory failure in patient weaning from mechanical ventilation. And it is uh, calculated very easily. Uh, this index equals the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume. Both of them, you can see them in the monitor of the patient in the screen of the ventilator. You will see the respiratory rate and tidal volume, and then you get the uh, how much is, it is. And it has been shown to correlate well with the work of breathing and the PTI in mechanically uh, ventilated patients. An in, uh, interest, in, um, interesting paper, I found it, uh, published by King Faisal Hospital here in Riyadh in June. And they studied around 86 patients. These patients are uh, post-cardiac surgery. And they, uh, they did this uh, rapid shallow breathing index and they found there is a, it is a good predictor for successful intubation. There is another parameter, it is the time to recovery for minute ventilation following a trial of weaning from mechanical ventilation. It is used as a predictor of successful extubation. And we know all, mechanic, uh, minute ventilation equal tidal volume type respiratory rate. So uh, during spontaneous breathing, the minute ventilation will increase because the patient will uh, attempt to manage the increased work load and then his respiratory rate will increase. And once the one of these parameters, two parameters increase, your minute ventilation will increase. If the tidal volume increase or respiratory rate increase, the minute volume will increase. But commonly, patients tend to increase their respiratory rate, uh, and then they have increased workload. So their minute ventilation will increase. And when the spontaneous breast uh, trial has concluded, and you put the patient on the ventilator back, so the workload for the patient will be reduced. And the, uh, the minute ventilation will go return back to the baseline. The time for the recovery of the minute ventilation will predict for you whether the patient can have a successful extubation or not. So the shorter the time, uh, it is the better. But uh, if the patient takes longer time, it means that maybe your patient is not ready yet. There is another one, which is the negative inspiratory force, one of the markers that uh, the patient can generate uh, uh, against an occluded valve. Uh, negative force that is weaker than minus 30 implies respiratory muscle weakness and difficult extubation. But this is for the adult. For us in the pediatrics, together with uh, our colleagues, we are uh, happy if a patient with minus 15, his still can breathe uh, properly. It means that his uh, respiratory forces are good. And we have other things. We have the P100 or P01 is a measurement of inspiratory occlusion pressure. Uh, in, uh, previously, they used to do it how inspiratory arm of the ventilator is occluded. We know that in, a, in our ventilator, we have the tubing, we have the inspiratory arm, we have the uh, expiratory arm. So you occlude the inspiratory arm uh, during expiration for 100 milliseconds and five measurements of pressure are determined by a pressure transducer over 60 uh, to 90 second period. And then the average of this measure is the uh, PO1. And several groups have found that the 
PO1 is a successful independent predictor of ventilator weaning. But luckily uh, for us, we don't have to do anything uh, here for this successive uh, measurement. We have the PO1 value in our ventilator building uh, automatically. And values uh, greater than 4.5 centimeters associated with a poorer rate of extubation. And then uh, the, the one of the things that you can try it if you are not very sure that the patient is going to tolerate the extubation trial is the TPs. And simply the TPs, you have a, a inspiratory, uh, uh, inspiratory, inspiratory limb for the patient, and then you connect it to oxygen source, and then you give the patient a trial to 30 minutes to maximum one hour. And if uh, they are able to breathe, maintain their saturation, they did not become tachycardic, they did not become exhausted, also this predict that the patient uh, can be extubated successfully. So in summary, these are the uh, ways that you can uh, judge if your patient is ready for extubation or not. Uh, and this in addition to uh, our other at bedside uh, prediction of the successful extubation, you have to take in, con uh, in context that what was the primary disease for the patient, why I intubated my patient in the first place, whether the primary disease is improving or still evolving, whether I need still uh, brain imaging for the patient, whether the patient will enter another procedure that needs uh, that he will be kept on mechanical ventilation. And then uh, this mechanic for the intensivist. And this is the last slide. This is the last slide just for all of you to breathe and to look again at the forces or the pressures that affect the uh, mechanics of the lungs. And this is the, if you remember also, we discussed it in the previous slide. This is the uh, pressure in the, at the mouth of the airway. And then we have here the alveolar pressure. We have the pleural pressure and we have the atmospheric pressure and the pressure at the body surface. And uh, here we have uh, some summations, we have the transpulmonary pressure, which equals the alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure. And then we have the transthoracic pressure, which equals the alveolar minus the body surface area pressure. And then we have trans airway pressure, which equals the pressure at the airway opening minus the alveolar pressure. We have the trans uh, respiratory pressure, which is a summation of the um, pressure at the airway opening minus the pressure at the body surface area. and then. I want you to remember that the flow of the gas will depend on the, the pressure gradients at the patients. Uh, this concludes our uh, presentation. Okay. Dr. Salma, mashallah.